What is the difference between dry eye, my blooming gland dysfunction, and ocular rosacea? In this episode of OcuTalk, ophthalmologist Kelsey Greider Sedaris will be explaining what ocular rosacea is, what causes it, and how to treat it. Dr. Greider? I want to talk to you. Not now, later. No, now. Welcome back to another edition of OcuTalk. Today, we are going to be talking with Dr. Kelsey Greider. Dr. Greider, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background uh, and your specialty to get started? Okay, great. So I'm a comprehensive ophthalmologist, and I came into practice here in San Diego, where I'm actually joined practice with my father, Dr. Brad Greider, who's been here for the last you know, 35, 40 years. And where I trained out in the middle of the country, we didn't have as much dry eye as we do in San Diego. And when I came out to San Diego, more of an arid climate and um, kind of, you know, developed my new patient base, I realized how big of a problem dry eye and blepharitis actually was for all of my patients on a daily basis. So coming out of training, I was just a general ophthalmologist, but I've really transitioned into a little bit more of a dry eye blepharitis niche in my practice. And I also do eyelid surgery and minor eyelid procedures in the clinic and do a lot of glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy screaming as well. For our discussion today, we were hoping you could talk to us a little bit about ocular rosacea. What exactly is ocular rosacea? So ocular rosacea is one of the subtypes of rosacea. And rosacea is a kind of general dermatologic inflammatory condition where patients may have facial flushing, acne, kind of pustules on the cheeks and nose area, and also dry eye, redness of the eyes and redness around the eye area. Uh, it's extremely common. If you look up what kind of percentages you see in the population, you'll see any numbers from like 6% to 50%. But from a doctor who sees patients on a daily basis, I'd have to say upwards of 75% in my own clinical practice, whether that be because patients are coming in because they have symptoms of it, or because of the area in which I practice. Um, but it's a very common condition and a lot of dermatologists are managing you know, patients with the facial rosacea. We'll also find patients with ocular rosacea and that's where they end up in the eye clinic as well. Wow, that's a significant number of patients. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so it's a crossover between derm and ophthalmology and optometry really. Um, so it's inflammation in the skin and in the eyelids and on the ocular surface as well. What exactly causes this ocular rosacea to happen, rosacea, ocular rosacea? What's the root cause? So the root cause is inflammation, and it's kind of like we're reacting to our normal skin flora, normal bacteria around the eyelid margin, um, some mites that well, actually most patients end up having as well, um, and also altered vascular flow. So what ends up happening is we have this kind of like hyperreactive vascular blood flow in the skin of the face and the eyelids. And so patients might end up with periods of flushing after exercise, caffeine, alcohol, spicy food intake. And on top of the flushing, they end up with these kind of abnormal capillaries, little blood vessels that shouldn't be there. So you end up with what's typically described as kind of like the Santa Claus appearance where you can get really red cheeks and nose and very red around the eyes, like the rims of the eyes and on the whites of the eyes as well. Um, so it's just more of this kind of vascular hyperreactivity, inflammation to, to ourselves and to the bacteria that's there and kind of hyperreacting to a lot of things in our daily life and diet as well. So what are the risk factors associated with it for your patients? So I think it's mostly an underlying genetic makeup. People are kind of born with rosacea or not and may develop it over time. I don't really think of it as more of like a risk factor for having rosacea. I think it's more risk factors of things that if you have rosacea, what's going to make you more symptomatic and make the condition worsen. So being in warm climates like San Diego, um, that can add to it because if you've got this vessel hyperreactivity, when you're hot, you might flush more and that makes the condition worse. Um, people who exercise a lot, also San Diego, we're a very active community. So people are out exercising, they get facial flushing and that can worsen the rosacea and spicy foods like in our diet here as well. Same with alcohol and caffeine intake. UV exposure, I think also plays a big role as well. Um, so we kind of end up with a large patient population here who have all the risk factors for worsening rosacea, and they may present more symptomatically than necessarily in other parts of the country. 
Is it age related at all? Is it something that you're born with or something that develops as you age? So you can have signs of ocular rosacea in children and teenage years. It's more common around the like 30s, 40s, 50s age range. And based out of my practice, you know, we are an ophthalmology practice. We do tend to see older adults and individuals. Um, it's not that it's not as common in older age ranges as it is younger. I just think that the symptoms may start to worsen more in the 30s to 50s range. And certainly with women, um, if they're going through menopause and have hormonal fluctuations and hormonal changes that involve hot flashes and flushing, that's really when we're going to see more signs of ocular rosacea start to emerge as well. So what are the actual signs I should be looking for as a patient to alert me that that's what's actually going on? If I exercise a lot and my face just gets red, uh, do I know that I need to go see a doctor? Like what's, what are the alerting uh, uh, symptoms for us to know, hey, it's time to go see Dr. Greider? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so there are some very common uh, symptoms that we'll start with kind of the more broad. So something that I really noticed over the last few years was during the pandemic when people were shifting more into virtual work and working from computers and screens more often, one of the major things that happens with ocular rosacea is we end up with something called evaporative dry eye. So the rosacea is causing this inflammation in the oil glands, in the the eyelids that cause difficulty with creating healthy oil flow into the tear film. And when you don't have a nice lubricating oil film in the tear film, the tears are more just watery and they evaporate off the surface. So what a lot of patients have been presenting with is, you know, they're trying to work on screens and their eyes are drying out, getting red, tiring out, and um, vision actually ultimately gets blurry um, because that tear film is really important for maintaining clear vision and keeping the eyes comfortable and it just evaporates away. So that's actually um, one of the most common signs of having ocular rosacea. In addition to that, um, patients might have kind of more of like a red burning sensation, um, a lot of dry eye at night, I think, is actually attributed mostly to ocular rosacea or blepharitis or meibomian gland dysfunction, which there's a lot of overlap in the three. Um, it's because, you know, you've got your eyes closed and it feels like there's rocks in them at night. Sometimes that's because we've got inflammation in the tear film and it's just being kept on the surface of the eye with our eyes closed at night. So not only are you getting evaporative dry eye when you're working in a computer, when your eyes are closed, they're also uncomfortable. Um, patients also will get a lot of redness and you can end up with very red on that lid margin and also on the surface white part of the eye and also styes. So styes are part of ocular rosacea. So with rosacea where you're getting the acne on the cheeks and nose, you can also end up with kind of what's similar to acne in the lid where you get a clogged and inflamed oil gland in the lid and, and that's a sty or chalazion. And those can be really uncomfortable. Um, cosmetically, they're not great to deal with either. You've got like a big pimple on your eyelid that can take weeks, if not months to go away or may need to be surgically excised. So um, that's definitely, if you're noticing any of the earlier, more broad symptoms, that can be a reason to come in and see us. And certainly if you end up with something like a chalazion, I'm sure you'll end up here as well to not only get rid of it, but try to prevent more from coming in the future. It sounds like there's a lot of overlap between dry eye, meibomian gland dysfunction, ocular rosacea. Are there any specific tests that uh, let you know, hey, that, that's what this is? Or uh, is it sort of uh, an amalgamation of treatments? Yeah, so there's a lot of different tests that we can do. Um, there's ways to differentiate between is this like a tear deficiency dry eye or is this an evaporative dry eye? Um, it can go from as broad as taking a look at a patient in the room, seeing that their cheeks and nose look like they've got signs of facial rosacea. At the slit lamp, we can take a look with higher magnification, see if we see these kind of abnormal blood vessels that are forming along the lid margin and signs of it as well on, on the conjunctiva and the white part of the eye with that kind of overall red appearance. Um, we can also do what we call their Schirmer's testing, where they test how much tears you make in a specific period of time, and that shows for tear deficiency. That would be more like a Sjogren's type of dry eye, um, which isn't necessarily along the lines of ocular rosacea. And then what we look for with evaporative dry eye is there's um, different tests. So we can do regular slit lamp exam. We put stain on the surface of the eye, have you blink a few times, hold your eyes open, and we measure how many seconds it takes for that tear film to evaporate off the surface. Um, and then as well, there's more fancy technologies like mybography, where you can actually take photos of the inside of the lids and you can visualize with IR or black and white photography, the mybomian glands and see if there's been any destruction or inflammation in those glands. 
Um, so, you know, you can go also into tear film assays. I know that there's a few companies out of San Diego that make tear film assays to look for things like MMP9, um, which is one of the more um, common inflammatory mediators in ocular rosacea. And they also look at like the osmolarity and the tear film as well with some of those tear film assays. I feel like it's pretty easy to diagnose by looking at someone's face, seeing if there's signs of rosacea, looking at the tear film evaporation and, and looking at their lid margin. Um, but if we want to get more technical and scientific with it, we can. Well, that sounds pretty impressive. That's a lot of testing. Uh, it's good to know there are so many options available out there. Um, on the opposite end of that, what are the treatment options available for ocular rosacea? Yes. Yeah, so this is something that I have found a special interest in. That's why it's my little niche in dry eye and blepharitis and ocular rosacea. So very interestingly, I feel like not a lot of treatments had existed up until recently, and now there's a lot of focus on dry eye and ocularization and how can we help patients with these conditions because they're so common and not only do they impact quality of life, but they can actually cause permanent vision loss if they get extreme. So we're talking end of the spectrum of having mild symptoms and discomfort and dry eye to corneal scarring and vision loss and perforation. So there's a big spectrum, but it is a big condition and it's very common and it really impacts our patients. So there's been a lot more focus on trying to find ways to treat it. So the original treatments are, okay, so we've got clogged up oil glands. What are we going to do to help open those oil glands and improve the tear film? So that's really where the old school hot compresses and lid scrubs with like baby shampoo um, came from. I prefer um, for doing that type of lid routine. I like doing hot compresses, but then using a commercial grade lid cleanser like OcuSoft is actually what I recommend to my patients and what we, we provide in our office um, to kind of open up the glands and then remove some of that debris, cut back on some of the bacteria that we tend to hyperreact to in rosacea. And also specifically with the tea tree oil type products and the OcuSoft allergy and the Oust brand that um, I like to recommend for my patients helps cut down on the Demodex mites, which um, recently we've been focusing quite a bit more on that tend to be present in ocular rosacea and also tend to worsen ocular rosacea. So if we can cut down on some of the bacteria and the mites, then we can really help some of that inflammation in the glands. So that's kind of the, the bread and butter. You wanna open the glands, clean the lid margin. In addition to that, there's other things like topical antibiotics, which we're using not for bacteria necessarily, we're cutting down some bacteria that we hyperreact to, but we're mostly treating inflammation. So you can use things like topical erythromycin, which has been around forever, and then there are oral antibiotics like doxycycline and minocycline, which we use at a sub-therapeutic level. So we're not treating an infection, um, but it's cutting down on the inflammation and that can help with the facial rosacea as well. Um, on top of that, um, we have new technologies like Lipaflow, which are indicated to kind of do the hot compresses at home. Instead, you do that in the office with some lid massage, kind of get all that clogged mybum out. And then we also have IPL, intense pulse light therapy, which is something that I'm really passionate about um, I brought it into our practice in early 2022 when the, um, the first machine came out that actually has a specified hand tip to treat the lid for ocular rosacea. Um, and it actually is working on the inflammation right where it starts. So we're trying to treat the rosacea by going after the abnormal blood vessels, cut down on the inflammatory mediators, help open up the glands, stabilize the tear film surface, and kill off some of those demodex mites as well. So I like to, in my practice, have patients do a really good lid hygiene routine, start with the basics, the hot compresses, maybe do some of the antibiotics, and then move up to IPL when they're ready. And I feel like there is a combination between nice IPL, lid hygiene for life, and touch-up sessions as needed in the future to really maintain that ocular surface and the lid health. And also, we can help with the skin of the face as well. So I did notice that you said lid hygiene for life. So is this something that is uh, ongoing treatment in perpetuity or is this something that once they come in and see you eventually it's cured or it's just good to have long-term maintenance? Can you explain a little bit more about that? So rosacea is a lifelong condition. It's not something we're going to have that just goes away. Um, I like to say that we can get the symptoms pretty well under control, but it's something that needs lifelong maintenance. So maintenance treatments, 
And honestly, with the lid hygiene, this is just something that I feel like we should do. We brush our teeth every day. You got to make sure that we're taking care of our eyelid margin. I wear makeup, obviously. Um, and I think that it's really good to not only remove your makeup, but then go in after with, with again, commercial grade lid cleanser, where we're targeting the things that we tend to react to um, on the lid margin that are going to affect the ocular health and the surface of the eye. So if I have ocular rosacea, and I don't know it, and I let it go untreated for an extended period of time, is there any kind of long-term detrimental effects that that causes? What happens if the average patient just lets it go untreated? So the most common thing that ends up happening is someone will end up with a sty, and then that's their wake-up call. Like, oh my God, I've got this huge, painful lump on my lid, and it won't go away. And oh gosh, now I need to treat my ocular rosacea so this doesn't happen again. Um, so I think that that's kind of a big wake up call for patients with ocular rosacea, but that's probably one of the more benign ones. Um, the more in between what happens more frequently, but not as rarely as the more severe complications, but um, it is is something that impacts the health of the eye is patients can come in with peripheral ulceration. It's called marginal keratitis. And what ends up happening is a lot of that inflammation from the lid and the tear film starts to attack the peripheral cornea. And patients will come in with very painful, essentially ulcers in the periphery of their cornea. Um, but it's, it's mostly just kind of autoimmune white blood cells that are attacking that cornea in that area. So it's not necessarily an infection. It's just the body fighting the cornea. Um, so they'll have red, very painful eye light sensitivity. And we, we will treat them with first of all, steroids and um, a little bit of antibiotic to cover um, and then maintaining the lid margin health by again, lid hygiene and kind of getting them on this ocular rosacea treatment plan to reduce the incidence of having that happen in the future. Um, the more severe cases, patients can come in with those types of marginal keratitis that actually progress to like severe ulceration in the cornea and you can actually end up with corneal perforation in very severe cases. I've only seen a few cases of patients like that in my career where they could end up with permanent vision loss, but those patients do exist and it can happen over time. So your recommendation would be that patients should come in as soon as they start to feel uh, inflammation on the eyelids and some dry eye conditions? Yes. I usually tell patients something that I heard in medical school that really resonated with me is normal is a moving target. So you're probably going about your life thinking, oh, my eyes are red and scratchy and it feels like there's rocks in them at night and it gets blurry when I'm looking at the computer for too long or watching TV for too long or reading for too long. And that's just normal and it's just the way eyes are. But it's not necessarily how your eyes have to be. And with the right treatment options for you, then you don't have to deal with that. So normal being a moving target, we want to move you back to what actually the normal is in healthy and happy eyes. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Greider. Is there anything else you would like to talk to our audience about today? I would just like to recommend that if anyone has any discomfort with their eyes or any questions about what's going on with their eyes, that they reach out to find someone in their area that has the same similar type of niche and passion that I do for dry eye. We have a network of ophthalmologists and optometrists all around the country that care a lot about this condition and want to make patients feel better and have optimal quality of life. And we like to bounce ideas off each other and talk about the new emerging therapies, treatments, diagnostic modalities. So um, if you reach out to any of us, we can connect you with someone nearby who would be able to help take care of your, your condition and make sure that you have happy, healthy eyes. Well, thank you very much, doctor. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you for having me.